Welcome to another Fibre Laser Learning Lab. Today we're going to carry on a little bit more with the Mopa Laser design because I had a problem last time if you remember and I couldn't find out very much information about the actual pump lasers that were used with this system and to be honest I wasn't particularly worried because I didn't think it was relevant. Now as I mentioned to you before I was presented with this list of numbers here and these charts for all the 16 variable pulses that this machine can work with. Now this is a 20 watt machine and some of these pulses can deliver up to something like about 12 kilowatts or down here around about 7 or 8 kilowatts peak power. Sounds amazing. I've got no concept of what damage these shapes, these pulses can make to material because look we've got a pulse here which is only two nanoseconds wide. That's two billionths of a second. What damage can 12 kilowatts for two billionths of a second do? This machine does not produce 12 kilowatts continuously. It can only deal with it in dot 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 dots, spots. And those spots are only going to be as good as the lens can produce. And the spot size on here is 0.065 of a millimetre, 65 microns. I thought I would do a very quick test to get some sort of concept of what these numbers actually mean. So I jumped onto this Lotus Mark software, otherwise known as EasyCAD, and produced this matrix of the 16 pulses across here. And down here I've chosen 14 different frequencies from 1000 kilohertz down to 5 kilohertz. So first of all I ran it a couple of times on a piece of anodized, black anodized aluminium. And I think from where you're looking you'll quite clearly see that there is a lot more damage down here. It's difficult to see on aluminium. The problem with aluminium is it is a what I call a binary material. It's either black or white. There's nothing in between. I've generated these shades of grey on here by virtue of some patterning that I've done and I will talk about that in a future session. But instead of aluminium I chose to use a piece of stainless steel. It might look um, from your point of view at the moment as though it's, it's pretty bland, we've got some stuff down here and then nothing else. Here's an enlarged picture of the stainless steel. Obviously the background has now removed the reflectivity of it so it's much easier to see. Now the thing about stainless steel is it is not a binary material. As we heat it up it produces various oxide colours on the surface so there are shades that we can pick up. Now what you can't see with some of these colours here is the variation in depth that you can probably see much clearer under a microscope. But trust me, basically what we've got is very little power here decreasing to almost nothing over here and no power at all down in this corner. Hang about, I've got nothing down here, what's happened down here? Now this was my very simplified model of this machine, the MOPA. And in essence what we have, we've got two fibres. We've got one thin one and one thick one. This one here is I'd call a signal conditioning fibre that produces the signal, the pulses that we're looking for. And then they drop through to another fibre which amplifies the shape of that pulse to get an output. Now we went through clearly last time the way in which the laser, this, this type of laser, the fibre laser works. So I've drawn these pump lasers in blue. These are laser diodes which are injecting photons into the cladding here and the photons are whizzing around in here and they're colliding with these special ytterbium e electrons which are sitting in this very thin core. And so here we've got the seed laser which is a laser diode which injects coherent beam and runs through here collecting as it goes more and more photons. So the beam then passes through to cross to this amplification stage where these laser diodes have already injected photons into here and excited this core up to its maximum energy potential. Now that was the way that which I was expecting it to work. Um, I did have a problem as you remember saying I couldn't quite work out how these laser diodes were working. 
if you assume that these laser diodes are on all the time, which is what I did, so let's take this example here of 8 nanoseconds and 250 kilohertz. So every cycle takes 4 microseconds, and 4 microseconds is 4,000 nanoseconds. So we want an 8 nanosecond pulse, but I've got 4,000 nanoseconds ahead of that pulse in which to charge up these inner cores. I was expecting to see pulses all the way down to zero almost. Well, the 8 nanoseconds is that line. And the 250, I haven't got 250 because it's between 200 and 300. So it's somewhere across there. All right. So it's between these two. So basically it's there is my maximum power. And if we take a look at the colours, we can clearly see that we've got maximum power there because it's fainter there and it drops off there. But hang about, it drops off there. And then there's, well, there's just a hint of something there, and then there's nothing. Why is there nothing? Because this, this model that I'd produced predicted that I would have this density all the way down to the bottom. That was my problem. All these are missing down here for a very good reason. And the missing part of the puzzle was all to do with these blue pump diodes, how they work. And I had to go back to Lotus Laser where their expertise was able to furnish me with the details. The secret is these do not run at constant power. They run at variable powers when and just before the seed laser is injected into the system. Obviously the less power that we feed to these diodes and the less photons and the slower the excitation rate of the electrons in that core. Because it turns out that to put too much power in here for too long is not good for the lifetime of the core material. OK, now I hope this diagram will help rather than hinder your understanding of the process. Here we're showing the frequency scale from 0 to 1000 kilohertz. The period between the pulses is getting longer and longer and longer as the frequency gets lower and lower. And that's quite important because here we can see the blue pump diode intensity with this line and along the top here. And the intensity is increasing with frequency. And then it stays level. My assumption with my model was that it was level from the start and that was where my failure occurred. It takes but a few nanoseconds to promote enough electrons in here up to their excited level. So we certainly don't need 4,000 nanoseconds here to build up energy for an 8 nanosecond pulse. Hence the reason why they start off at zero and gradually build it up towards the point where we are going to discharge our 8 nanosecond pulse. And at that point there we've got 20 watts of energy stored in the fibre. It's been arranged such that we get our peak power at 8 nanoseconds. And after 8 nanoseconds, the power starts to drop off. Now, why does it drop off? Well, the power doesn't drop off at all. There's still 20 watts all the way down this line. It's just that the pulse repetition rate is increasing. And what that basically means is, let's assume we had a cake here. One cake equals 20 watts. And we're going to cut the cake into 250 slices. When we get to this end, we're going to cut the cake into a thousand slices. So the slices at this end are much smaller than they are at this end. We've still got a cake. But what basically that means, we've got less power per pulse as we get to the higher frequencies. When we look at our 8 nanosecond pulse here at 250 kilohertz, um, we can see that we've got peak power. Look, they're both black, just either side of the ideal, which is in the middle there. So there we are at 100 kilohertz, and at 100 kilohertz, we come up here, and we find that we've only got a very small amount of power. Power roughly, let's just guess, the same as we would have if we were at 700. And 700 is about here. And yeah, there's not a lot of difference between those two. The point being that We've got decreasing power 
down here and the further we come down on the frequency range the less power we shall have to recharge the fiber and less power means we shall have no pulses now this graph showing its decrease in recharging ability as we get to the lower frequencies clearly explains why we haven't got anything down here and conversely when we start increasing the frequency up here the power starts dropping off so as we go up the frequency chart the power is clearly dropping off so all of a sudden everything is explained it's all nice and neat and tidy and we understand how the MOPA laser works so now we've found another parameter which we can play with i.e. frequency which will allow us to control the power in the pulse beyond the peak power values that are set I think we could also play with this but this is a much more uncontrollable section down below the peak power I think we stand much more chance of using this part of the curve it does add to the pool of variables yet something else that we can use to change the energy density at the surface of a piece of material this machine only produces dots and we only damage the surface by converting the light energy into heat energy within the atomic structure of the material we've got all these variables to play with to cause that heating effect so within the program the software program we have the opportunity to change the percentage power well I don't know quite what that's doing I've got an idea that that might actually be changing the power of the pump laces so that we can regulate the if you like the amount of energy it might be doing exactly the same as this when we increase the frequency if it is then we've got two ways of changing the power per pulse or the energy per pulse one of them is with the percent power button and the other one is with the if you like the pulse repetition rate which is in fact the frequency and although we're changing this frequency we're also changing the frequency of a specific pulse that we've decided to use now after percent power we've got 16 pulse durations there the question I don't know is whether or not if I choose a 15 nanosecond pulse will it either drop back to a 13 nanosecond pulse or will it go up to a 20 nanosecond pulse or will it actually respond to something in between maybe I'll find out directly from Lotus Laser so for each one of these specified pulses there is a maximum power or a maximum amount of energy but in addition to that we've also got other opportunities as we're finding out by playing with the power to change the energy per pulse so we've got the opportunity of playing with the pulse energy now the other thing that can dramatically change things is speed now unlike the continuous beam laser we are pulsing on this machine and that gives us a completely different set of circumstances I've got a line which is 0.1 millimeters long and I'm going to run at a thousand millimeters a second along that line so that's going to take roughly a hundred uh, microseconds to scan that at a thousand millimeters a second if I'm using the two nanosecond pulse at 850 kilohertz which is the top one on this chart then basically here's what I'm going to get I'm going to get a huge number of pulses along that 0.1 of a millimeter line I'm going to get huge energy density in the area because I'm going over the same spot again and again and again and again now this is where something else comes into play now, I haven't got my decent piece of paper here at the moment but if we take a quick look at the relationship between the pulse length and the repetition rate which is the frequency if I just round that up to a thousand for the sake of argument I've got one microsecond per cycle and I've got two nanoseconds of power within that cycle so that's two nanoseconds per thousand nanoseconds which is a ratio of 500 to 1 or basically 498 of the power being off 
and one of it being on. So that's a heating to cooling ratio of almost 500 to one. So there's a 500 delay time to allow the heat to cool down. And if we take a look down this set of numbers here, we shall find that it drops down to as little as 114 to one at the bottom here for these longer pulses. So there's another factor there, which is, could be a very important factor. The fact that we haven't got as much cooling time down here. In other words, we're likely to build up the heat in the surface quicker. The whole way in which this machine works is by creating heat in the surface. So this, I believe, is a very important factor when it comes to assessing which of these we should choose to do certain types of job. Now, I think probably people have been round and they've trawled all these numbers and they've put them in thousands of hours of testing and they've found things that work. I haven't got thousands of hours left in my lifetime. So I'm not certainly going to do that. I want to try and choose some factors which will give me the information quickly. So speed. I mean, if I run the same thing, 1,000 millimetres a second, but this time we'll go to 350 nanoseconds, which is this one, 350 nanoseconds. OK, the heating and cooling ratio is different. We're not going to cool as quickly as the previous one, and we're going to probably have put more energy into it as well. So the net effect should be greater. But if we carry on running that at 1,000 millimetres per second, and we also run it at 25 kilohertz, because the pulse rate is so much slower, what's going to happen is we're going to space these out, and we're not going to get as much of a heating effect. So we're certainly probably not going to get as much power into the surface this way as if we were to do it this way, I don't think. But I don't know. That's what we're going to have to try and find out. So that's how speed is going to affect us. So as well as speed, we've got scan patterns. Now there are several ideas for the scan pattern. Number one is we could just scan, 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 scan and put the lines beside each other. And accept that as the heating effect for there. And now we've got another heating effect here and another heating effect here. Or we can overlap them. So, for instance, if this is a 0.03 spot on here, if I shift it down by 0.015 pitch, then I will double up on that half of the heating and put a new set here. And then when I put another line down, that will get doubled up. So there will be a different energy density if I cho choose to use a line spacing of 0.03. 03 or 0.015. There are other things in scan pattern which the software allows us to do. As well as this overlapping pattern, we can scan in one direction only. The other way is to scan and come back, scan, and then go back, scan, like that. So we've got unidirectional or bidirectional scanning. There's another option as well and that is to send the dot in a, a circular motion. In other words, we start off with our dot there, but we can do this with it, and we can drive the dot round in a circular pattern to produce this overlapping high-density picture where we want high energy density into the surface to get the temperature up to do a certain amount of damage. Then we've got the beam profile. Now, this is an interesting one because they, they make a big thing about this machine having um, a Gaussian energy profile to the beam, which means we've got a lot more energy in the centre of the beam than we have at the outside edge of the beam, which means that we should be cutting grooves in the material effectively, which look like that. So there's the surface of the material. If we decide to scan across, we're likely to be putting grooves in which look like this. Now, there are other beam patterns that could be chosen that would produce a much flatter, more uniform shape. Rather than a Gaussian, you could have something like that, which, which would produce a much shallower, more even heating effect. I don't know whether that's what we need or not, but it is another variable. So that's beam profile. And then, of course, finally, we've got things like focus. Uh, that's a very emotive subject in some people's eyes. Um, 
Focus is focus and you must stay with the focus. But I'm here to break the rules. I'm very happy to run this machine at whatever is required because as you change the focus you're actually going to change the energy density in the in the little pool as we as we in, as we change the focus am i going to change the size of the beam that's a subject for a future session and then of course finally you've got material every material will have a different set of parameters is a year going to be long enough to try and find out how this machine works? Well, on that note, it sounds as though I'm going to be spending more time with this machine than I am with my wife. And I think that just about rounds off this second session and gives us a bit of a handle now, a real handle, on what this machine can do and the possible problems that we're going to encounter in the future with all these variables. So, thank you very much for your time and I'll catch up with you in the next session.